God's grace and peace to you, friends. It's April. Can you believe it? Can you believe it already that it's April? This year seems to be flying by like none other. And while there are a myriad of things that weigh us down, it is good to gather and celebrate the goodness of God. We see that goodness of God out in creation, but we see it in the faces of our brothers and sisters, the ones that are around us, in the faces of strangers and in the faces of those we know so well. God's glory is around if only we look to see it. So join me as we worship together. Would you join me in our invocation? Oh God, we expect demonstrations of power, but Jesus gives us a different vision of authority. We expect to have to fight, but Jesus shows us self-giving love. We expect to be afraid, but Jesus is the truth that sets us free. Let us pray. Whether you're walking the halls of power or standing just outside, you call just the same. Call us to heed the voice of truth, cutting through the shadow of death. Help us to build your kingdom, O God. Empower and encourage us to work and worship in your way of life. Amen. Would you join me in our prayer of confession? You are not the king we expect, for you rule from love without the violence upon which this world relies. We confess that we have been seduced by the power of the empire. We have allowed our attention to be captured by power and status. We have bought the lie that violence will bring us to safety, and we have listened to truth created to serve the few. And we admit, O oh God, that we are afraid scared of what others would think, afraid of being seen as weak, fearful for our own position and prosperity, anxious about what allowing your word to be alive would mean in our comfortable routines. 
We confess that we have let fear drive us, and we do not like where it has taken us. Forgive us, Lord, and change our direction. May the truth of your love overpower this world's empires, that we may turn again to your way of abundant life. We ask in the name of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus the Christ. Amen. People of God, do not be afraid. I say to you the name of Jesus Christ that you are a forgiven people. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, let us live as God's children, filled with light and life. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the 18th chapter of John and follows directly on the story of Peter's denial of Jesus. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters, so to avoid the ritual defilement and be able to eat the Passover feast. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jewish leaders replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were for this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to these leaders. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him again, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and to this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone from you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they replied in shouts, 
Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Here ends our reading of the Gospel of John. So this whole story today is a strange courtroom drama. Maybe not the most gripping of tales that you might find on daytime television, but nonetheless, it has all of that intrigue and drama, and it's very confusing, I think at least, until you know some history, some background, some understanding of why this is all taking place. It's not a surprise, the outcome of this, to be honest. But the how you get there is what adds that depth, that character, that richness to this story that hopefully will put this in a little bit of a new light for you. So the rough cut of this case goes, uh, Jesus has just met with the Pharisees and the other, the high priest, right? The temple guards, all these people have met. Peter has denied him, and now they have moved him to the home of the the, uh, governor, Pilate, the one who is in charge of the region. Um, they bring him to Pilate, 
they have a, shall we say, a chat. Pilate says, I see no problem with this man, but he also recognizes some other things and says, but I'll give you a choice. Who do you want? The leadership decides they'd rather have a bandit on the loose who is a convicted criminal than a revolutionary like Jesus. And then we move on and you know what happens next. So I want to talk about politics today. And I know you're all excited to talk about politics, but these are the politics of ancient Rome. Now, I'm going to assume that most of you didn't study classics as your major in college, if you did that route once upon a time, uh, because while it is fascinating, it doesn't necessarily have the most practical import on how we live our modern life. Some of us did that, though. And so this stuff fascinates me to no end, to see the machinery and how it works because I don't think it's all that different than today, although we don't use death so much, at least not in a physical sense. So here's the scoop. This is what's going on. This is the the mid, you know, in the 20s to 30s in the Roman Empire. Caesar is on the throne of the empire that is expanding little by little by little by little before it gets really crazy huge, right? You know the line, all roads lead to Rome, because in fact, Rome was the center of everything. In this world, Caesar was God. To say so was a capital offense. In this world, Caesar was also the king, the king of all kings. To say so, anything other than Caesar was king and God was a capital offense. The brutal tactics that were used by the Roman Empire to keep the Roman Empire in line are legendary. You've seen some of the movies, I'm sure, once upon a time, and you've seen what happens. It doesn't feel real sometimes, maybe more like a movie or a video game, but this is what actually happened. If you spoke out against the government, unless you were a senator or a citizen, there was a high likelihood that your life would be forfeit. For instance, one of my favorite pieces of nasty Roman military history is the term decimate. I'm sure you've heard this word, but you probably don't know the origin of this word that comes from the Latin military piece. To to decimate meant a Roman military commander or someone further up the food chain would decide that a troop or group or legion or whatnot of soldiers had committed what they would say is a capital offense, something along the lines of cowardice, mutiny, desertion, insubordination, or if they needed to pacify a rebel people. We'll get back to that one. And what would happen is they would say to the whole group of people, here's your whole group, and we're going to cast lots, right? You know that phrase, draw straws. And whoever draws a short straw will be beaten to death by their colleagues. I, I kid you not, this is the, what happened. So if a group was a coward, they would take and they would decimate. They would take one-tenth. So if there were 50 people in the group, they would pull five names and the soldiers in that group would have to kill their comrades for being cowardice. And the rest of them would be punished, but not by death because you didn't want to lose too many bodies. This is what Rome did. They crucified political prisoners for speaking out against Caesar or provincial governors, and they hung them for people to see to let them know that they meant business. You stepped out of line, you were dead. If you're a fan of mafia movies and the things, right, it's always, it's not just you, it's your family too. Yeah, Rome did that too. They're the ones who started doing this better than, if you can say better, than everybody else. Rome was vicious to the people who defied it. And Rome was also vicious to people who they felt betrayed them. So if you were, say, a provincial governor and things got out of hand, not only would they send soldiers to pacify the rebellious people, the governor would also be forfeit for allowing such a thing to happen. So maybe that gives you a little bit more background on what's going on and who these people are that Jesus and the Jewish leaders are dealing with. Now, the Jewish leaders at the time were allowed to remain Jewish and practice their faith so long as they also would acknowledge Rome. Now, it was a tension to say Caesar is God when they didn't believe it, and they were allowed in general to say, you don't cause trouble, we won't bring trouble upon you. Not a great position to be in. Passover, then, this celebration, 
is a very politically charged, scary holiday for the Romans. Why, you ask? Because Passover is the celebration the Jews held of throwing over and overthrowing the Egyptian overlords, the ones that had taken them captive, and they threw off their chains and moved from slavery to freedom. An immensely important festival, and people would come from everywhere to Jerusalem, the hub of it all, to celebrate throwing off the people who were oppressing them. Can you see why Rome was just a tiny bit on edge at this time? Now, Pilate, Pilate, as the governor of the area in here, would have been the one who was the overseer, right? He was the the governor, in fact. They would have Jewish collaborators of the leadership to say, you keep your people in line and I won't kill you. Um, Not a great deal for the Jewish leaders. Not honestly a great deal for the Romans because the same thing would happen if they did get out of line. So this is all going on at the same time. Caesar did not live in Jerusalem. He had his uh, residence there, but he lived on a coast in a beautiful Mediterranean city. And he ruled from afar and basically said, don't cause problems, we won't, we won't enforce too harshly. And it seemed to work kind of okay. There were uprising and revolts and things here and there, but they were all pretty small and they were nipped in the bud pretty darn quick. Judas Iscariot and Simon the Zealot, who was a disciple, were of this group who wanted to have armed revolution. You know, so you can also understand some of Judas's thinking, Simon, the zealot, one of the disciples, changed his tune and said, killing is not the answer. Judas clearly did not. So when, when these matters come up, when this argument happens in the Jewish community, especially in Jerusalem, especially at Passover, everyone is walking on pins and needles. Pilate has all political discretion. He makes the laws, so long as they fall in line and don't get too much. As long as Caesar gets his cut, Pilate can kind of do what he wants in general. Keep him in line, Caesar doesn't care. The Jews then have the leadership of the people. This is an occupied area. This isn't a Roman place that Jews happen to live in. This is a Jewish place that Rome took by force. And they can only decide about religious matters. And if they decide about religious matters, then it's them at fault. Well, Jesus was wildly popular with the people. Speaking of new life, talking about a kingdom not of this world, a reality that didn't include Rome. Yeah, you can see why that didn't go over well with the leadership, not just for the possible repercussions, but because it took them out of power. It took them out of position and prestige. So let's get back to our trial. Pilate brings Jesus in. The Jewish leaders would not go in because if they went in, they would be defiled for the Passover and couldn't celebrate. And so they let him at the gate. He goes in. Pilate questions him. They have their conversation about, my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate, let's just say, doesn't seem real interested. He's just kind of like, okay. Basically, his response is, I don't need this headache. And I really don't want to have a bunch of riled up people on a holiday like this. It's not worth my time or my trouble. Pilate has a lot to lose and very little to gain in dealing with Jesus. And the Jewish leaders know it, and they're willing to gamble here that this is one way to deal with what they see as their problem and not take the blame for it. Pilate's only concern, in general, was I don't want to agitate the minority on a nationalistic festival where there could be a revolt. He wasn't so concerned about his danger in the sense of, worrying about what would happen to those people. He was worried about what Caesar would say or someone further up that food chain would say about what happened while he was in charge. So they chat some more. It comes down to this piece, and Pilate ultimately says, what is truth? Now, what Pilate's talking about has nothing to do with what Jesus is talking about. I don't want to make it seem at all like Pilate is a sympathetic person to Jesus, and he's really thinking, what is truth? I want to learn. No. In Rome, the truth is what Caesar said. The state dictated to everyone what to believe. There were no questions asked and you did not dissent. If Rome says this is what it is, that is what is true. They didn't like the truth. They told you this is the new truth and you're just going to believe it. 
Jesus instead says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. This idea that truth is not a thing but an embodiment. That the question is, who is the truth? Jesus proclaims this upside-down kingdom that says that the kingdom of God is one that is sacrificial and life-giving, that love is offered up instead of punishment. Rome, Rome in all its glory, proclaims the status quo of the kingdom, that violence is control and power and you do what we say or you die. And so it throws it up as this idea of, do you want life-giving or life-taking? Something that deals life or deals death. I don't want to make it sound like it's so simple that it's an easy choice of which kingdom you want to follow. It's not, oh, I choose life and not death. That's just not how it works. We have to choose, though, where we pledge our allegiance, if you will, to the empire, to the world, to the thing that says certain people get some and other people don't, and that's the way of the world or to the kingdom of Christ who says all people are valuable in God's eyes for we are all God's children, that love is the answer and love will have the final word. It's too simple to say one or the other. The reality is we live in this dual kingdom, this kingdom where we must live in the empire as it were, no matter how proud we are of our origins, our countries, our communities, things like this, you got to recognize that there is not a Christian government in this world that somehow makes sure everyone is taken care of. It doesn't exist because greed, among other things, always seems to take precedence. But the reality is, living in this kingdom where death is the answer versus life, we have to strive to create a kingdom that promotes life and love and light in the midst of the darkness of an empire that says, we make the rules and break them at your own peril. So you all know, I'm a big fan of Harry Potter. And one of the most striking lines in the entire series of books comes in the fourth book, as they recognize that the evil monster of the, the, the villain of the entire series of Voldemort is back. And Albus Dumbledore sits with Harry as he's processing grief and despair, trying to figure out how he lives in a world where he knows such evil exists. And Dumbledore says to this child, he says, dark times lie ahead for us, and there will be a time when we must choose between what is easy and what is right. I think Jesus offers the same question to Pilate. He offers it to the disciples and the leadership. He offers it to the people. Do you want to do what's easy? Or do you want to do what's right? Easy wins out more often than not. Easy is by nature easy. And what is doing right is often hard and difficult and it costs. Dealing out death, taking of life, taking of livelihood, taking of dignity doesn't take a whole lot of effort. But offering self-giving love and sacrifice, especially to people we don't necessarily agree with, is hard. It's difficult. It's not something you take lightly. Jesus says to Pilate, Jesus says to the disciples, what's your choice? Are you going to serve the empire or the kingdom of God? Are you going to deal death and destruction to all people to decimate God's kingdom? Or you lead to light and life and lift up and build up the body of Christ? Like I said, it's not easy. But we're offered a choice time and time again. And like Peter, who made the bad choice at first, Jesus comes back and offers him another chance to say, renounce those practices that cause hardship and pain and struggle for others and join me in this kingdom of love. I hope when you make decisions, when you look at the world, you can look and set aside your modern day politics, set aside your modern day beliefs and look to say, is this building up the kingdom of God 
or is this causing death and destruction? I know it's not that easy, but it's a start to look at how we are living, how we are embodying the risen Christ, especially in this time of Lent. Amen. join me in prayer. God, we come to you this day, our hearts full, full of grief and pain, of sorrow and doubt, but also of hope, of love and joy. Help us to live in the light and truth through your Son, Christ. Help us to understand what it is to find the abundant life and to live in your love. Help us to turn away from the places that would use us and abuse us. Help us turn away from all of those places that say we will never be enough. We know that our love for you is overshadowed by your love for us. We know that the gifts we pour back on your kingdom 
are nothing compared to the blessings you have already poured out upon us. Help us to take those gifts and blessings. Help us to take that love and light that you so freely give to us and turn it back to build your kingdom in this world, to offer hope for the hopeless, to offer the good things that people need to live an abundant life, to help us take care of those who are lonely and sick, for those who have been taken away and excluded. Help us in all things fulfill your law of love upon our hearts that calls us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We do this, God, because we want to. Not because you've said we have to. Not because it's required for your love. But because the one you sent to us who loves us so much did this for us. And so we try to imitate. We try to do the same as he did. To care for your children far and wide. Help us as we walk this path. As we deal with the darkness that is surrounded when love is overtaken by empire. Help us to see good things, God, in spite of the darkness that surrounds us. Open our eyes to your light that we may reflect it back on a world in need. It is because of your great love that we raise our voices together and pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, as you head out into the wide world of confusion and difficulty, in the wide world where everything gives you choices, what are you going to choose? What's right or what's easy? The way of the risen Christ, 
of love or not. May you keep walking the path that he has laid out before us. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.